So hi everyone. Um, my name is Mirek Mazala. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I'm doing a talk on starting the new score design team. Um, it's more of a talk on what's to come than what has been uh, because it's just starting out. Um, so what is new score? Um, new score is this score writing program where you can write scores, uh, edit scores, share scores. Um, it has an online platform as well that you can share scores to uh, and that you can download scores from. Um, so my goal wasn't just to start a design team for MuseScore. Uh, it was also to figure out how to do user-centered design effectively in volunteer-based communities. Uh, I used to be a volunteer in um, the user experience design team uh, for LibreOffice. Uh, so I had some experience with that and I feel like consistently not just with LibreOffice but with various open source uh, design teams, one thing that felt like was missing was the user. There was not enough research being done. Um, there often wasn't a solid basis for some de decisions being made. A lot of designers were making decisions based on their own experience without doing um, research and I haven't really seen user research um, being done on a larger basis in open source projects. I'm also working part-time as a user experience designer. I'm studying uh, some subjects in human-computer interactions, so I was coming from that as well. And, um, and this is a book that I was basing a lot of the processes that I tried to incorporate and that I'm going to try to incorporate. Um, into the design team. Uh, it's Designing for the Digital Age. It was written by Kim Goodwin, who used to be vice president at Cooper. Cooper is one of the largest um, and most famous design consultancies. And um, it's, it's a really huge book. And it's very detailed. And it goes through the entire process um, of user experience design, uh, user-centered user experience design. Um, so when I say user-centered uh, design, what do I mean? Well, Wikipedia defines it as um, a framework uh, of processes in which the needs, wants, and limitations of end users are given extensive attention at each stage. Uh, that means that you do research at the beginning, then uh, that research, you usually have personas, uh, which are, you take the data from that research and um, make fictional fictional people, fictional characters that exemplify the patterns that you found in, in that research that you did. And then once you start designing, you test, you keep testing, you validate hypotheses, you um, make sure that what you're making is being actually useful to the people that you're making it for, and you keep the personas in mind throughout the whole process. Um, why is this important? Uh, well, it lets everyone understand the needs, the workflows, and the mental models of the people involved in the um, in whatever you're designing. So that basically makes you able to understand how what kind what different kinds of people are using your software. It's not just you. It's not just your surroundings. It makes you aware of, of who all is using your software and. Um, it also gives you a better perspective on what the needs are. You're not just copying competition. Um, it gets the whole team thinking about the target users. It makes it clear who the co target users are and aren't. You know who you're designing for. Um, there's a concept called the elastic user, which is basically sometimes you hear arguments from developers, oh, we need, I don't know, we, we definitely need a a wizard for this because it's just too hard. But then at other times, oh, it's fine. You know, they'll figure it out because they're clever and then they can look through documentation, right? And so you have these opposing um, views on who the user is, and it's the same user. And you're designing. You know, you you have a very schizophrenic uh, interface if you're designing that way. Uh, the personas help you keep grounded on who the actual users are going to be and what their needs are. Uh, and it resolves arguments. Um, so if you have data to back up your arguments, then it's much easier to resolve them. Uh, I'm not sure what I did there. Sorry. Oh, 
And, and it also helps you keep your leg up on the competition because you actually know the needs. You're not just copying blindly what the others are doing. Um, so what I tried to do is get a local meetup uh, running. First of all, I wasn't really experienced with um, running something locally. I've only been a volunteer in uh, web-based uh, design communities. So and there were a lot of in inefficiencies in doing things uh, on the web in communication and setting times. So I was wondering, what's it going to be like if you do it locally? Uh, so I started a meetup uh, on meetup.com. Um, the idea was to you know, start with research, start doing research as a first step, uh, get some personas, as I mentioned. And um, then once we have the personas ready, the personas would be the basis of everything and would inform all the design going forward. Uh, we just start solving user experience problems. You know, we do some, the process was you do some testing at the beginning or you look for some hypotheses or, you know, people would have some ideas of what the bugs were. Maybe you'd have some bugs in the bug tracker. Uh, you do research and ideation for, you know, the bugs that you identified. Um, then you use your personas and put them in the sound and scenarios in which they're running into this bug. Um, and try to find solutions for personas in those scenarios. Um, then you do some wireframes, you test those. Maybe you go to mock-up phase and test on the mock-ups themselves because sometimes you don't really need a uh, uh, wireframing phase. It's easier sometimes to just do the mock-ups. And then we do testing, and once we figured out, oh, OK, this works for people, we'd move on to the next bug. So really a straightforward process um, that can be applied not just in MuseScore, but in other communities as well. Uh, so how did it go? So it didn't go that well. And it was partly because I didn't really have that much time to devote to it. Um, so this is the first meeting where we set up you know, what, what it's going to be like. Uh, we talked about uh, what our plans are, what the vision is. Uh, and that was nice. Uh, but then the next meeting, uh, I had a set of four completely different people. Um, so I didn't expect the base to be quite so changeable. Um, but it, it still kept going. You know, we did uh, the next time there were four of us, some from the first meeting, some from the second meeting. And uh, we did some stakeholder interviews to find out what the stakeholders were looking for, who the users were, et cetera. And then the next meeting, we had six people. Uh, that was the busiest one, I think. I think this is it. Uh, and we were still doing stakeholder interviews. We were talking about the user experience design process in general. And it seemed to be working relatively well. People, will, people seemed to be motivated because these people, they were coming into it uh, because they wanted to learn the user experience design process. Uh, they didn't really have experience with it. Um, so it was interesting to them, but at the same time, they didn't have that much time to devote, which actually showed up afterwards. We were starting to do user research prep, um, and there weren't that many people coming. First, you know, the next meeting, one me meeting had to be canceled. The next meeting, uh, two people came, and we just talked about user research. And then the meeting afterwards, we started pe preparing uh, for user research, you know, who we could, um, where we could find people, uh, what people are we looking for, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Um, and that last meeting was kind of a bit disorganized, so it might have discouraged people because nobody came the next time. And then the next time, again, nobody came. And I wasn't really willing to devote the time to, to it. I had school, I had work. So I put it on hi 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 hiatus for a while. Uh, and then started in January, started up again in January. Um, and it was kind of lukewarm. Uh, it started out a bit slow. Uh, but at the same time, we were able to have a meetup. We did do three interviews uh, in January. Um, there were some problems with the interviews. So 
that makes me actually inspired to do more work in terms of uh, teaching people how to do user interviews, um, putting more effort into resources. Uh, because the interviews that we had were more marketing driven and more um, focused on the current software rather than the users. Um, so that's where we are now. Uh, the lessons learned. Um, well, I learned that people really need resources and that it's, there's a shortage of uh, quickly digestible resources for people to use and people to get involved right away. Um, if I show people designing for the digital age, it's such a huge complex book that it discourages them from contributing. So what I'd like to do now is put more time and effort into uh, into the resources that there are and trying to find resources. So if you have any tips, let me know. Um, so another thing, volunteers come and go. I can't count on the same people uh, to keep con contributing. I have to be prepared for uh, you know, new people coming in and how to in integrate them as fast as possible. Uh, maybe some easy hacks would be, would be good to get people in integrated. Um, people's time is precious, so you really need to also focus on motivation and keeping them uh, feeling like their time is being used as, uh, as well as possible. Um, and the people that are coming are generally inexperienced, so you really do need to teach them how to do user experience design. Um, these people that were coming to the meetups were also not experienced in uh, music music theories so that's also something to keep in mind when you're doing when you're working with a local group you'll you're less likely to find if you have specialized software people who are interested in that specialized software so that's where online communities really have the upper hand uh, because it's easier to find people so going forward uh, I'm going to be gathering resources making more resources um, I'm going to be trying to build a stronger community. Something that I was missing was another person to help me keep the things going because I really was running out of time. Um, I didn't really have the time to devote to this. Uh, and it would be helpful to have someone else. So if there's anyone here who'd like to get involved, let me know. Um, especially if you're more experienced. But e even if you're not, uh, there's lots of stuff to do. Um, uh, and I'd like to actually do a mix of offline and online communities because both are um, both are useful. Um, I'd like to define the roles better. Something that, as I've mentioned, I don't really see user research being done often. And research uh, research researchers can actually have a different set of um, set of skills than you know your standard interaction designer. Um, and that's something that you could use different people for, right? If somebody isn't comfortable making wireframes, isn't comfortable, you know, going through, you know, layout and graphic theory, um, they can do this. They can ask questions. They can uh, gather data. They can make personas. Uh, that's a completely different, and I think, uh, in the open source world, relatively unexplored uh, role that we could have. Um, also. Research participants, you don't have to know anything. You can just participate in interviews. And we absolutely need those people. So if you have no skills and can talk, then you're, you're perfect for open source volunteering. Um, and there's, there's different stuff. Visual designers, of course, um, field experts, people who know the domain, um, interaction designers, uh, motion designers as well. And I'd like to iterate on the process a bit more. Um, I mentioned the process before. Uh, now I'm also thinking about doing Lean UX. So in Lean UX, instead of doing research up front and then making personas from that, you do proto personas based on your assumptions of who the users are going to be. And then you validate them. Then you basically grow them into full, full blown personas. So you start with the fictional characters, but over time, um, they get validated through actual research. Uh, the benefit of that is we could start working on the bugs right away with an idea of who the users are. And then we'll refine the personas over time. 
Um, and I want to aim for replicability because I'd really like other open source communities to also focus more on user research. Um, and if that's something that you'd like to do in your community, we could connect up and find ways to incorporate user research and testing uh, basically user-centered design into uh, an existing design team or into a new design team if you'd like to start one. Um, so no, let me know your thoughts. This is my email address. Um, and I'd like to take comments, questions, thoughts right now, if you have any. Uh, uh, right, so, um, the yeah, okay, uh, so the question was, uh, why a mix of offline and uh, online communities? Uh, I think the advantage of offline communities can be, well, you have stronger bonds, uh, it's easier to coordinate, uh, and it's also easier if you're going to be conducting user interviews, then Ideally, you'd have two people at user interviews, one to take notes, one to ask questions so that each person can you know, focus a bit and the person taking notes can fill in if the other person doesn't know what to ask. And that's always easier to coordinate locally. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, I think o online only has um, some certain advantages of its own. It's easier to find volunteers. Uh, the follow volunteers tend to be more motivated because they're, you know, they're coming online. They may be associated with the software itself. So um, there are definite advantages to doing it online as well. And you can still do local interviews, but generally alone. Um, so yeah. So, uh, Prague. This was in Prague. Czech Republic. Uh, so the frequency, uh, it was partly based on the first meetings that, that I had, you know, how frequently others um, felt like they, they could devote time to this. And it was also partly based on my schedule because I'm working, I have school, so I needed to coordinate these things. And um, it turned out to be, you know, the idea was to have it once a week. Uh, but then sometimes it fell through because some people couldn't go. I sometimes couldn't go. Um, so that, that's how we decided. Um, so with the Lean UX um, approach, I see one danger that um, you create your personas that you think of. And then when you interview people, you only um, take in what, uh, what validates your persona you had in mind and kind of miss the rest of it. Right. Is, is that something that you experienced with that approach or was, was it not a problem? So, so the question is uh, with Lean UX, if there's a danger of just incorporating the stuff from the proto personas uh, or just, you know, the pr proto personas being very much like um, uh, influencing the course of the research. and. I agree with you. That's that's actually why I didn't do Lean UX at first because that's something that I that does concern me. Uh, if you do research afterwards and start with proto personas, you're more likely to your final personas are more likely to be like the original proto personas. That said, it does have the advantage of you being able to start right away on fixing user experience bugs and not having to worry about that so so this is something that you need to keep in mind while doing the research. Um, I'm not sure if there's an easy solution, but really keep in try to be objective when incorporating that research uh, in. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you were looking for your volunteers, uh, did you look for people who were already familiar with Lean Store from the Lean Store community? Or were you looking for people who were more interested in, in the UX? Uh, so, so the question is, when I was looking for volunteers, was I looking for um, new people interested in MuseScore or people interested in UX? Um, 
good question. I so I just started a meetup and I I was kind of freeballing it. So it was more like you know people who are interested in open source or user experience design. I tagged this event on meetup.com using these various tags, uh, music as well, and the people that came generally came from generally were interested in user experience design and weren't experienced in it. And the thing that motivated them in coming uh, to the meetups was learning how to do user experience design. Um, I'm not sure if that was because of the description of the, uh, of the project. If you know, people interested in music didn't feel like they could get involved, I'm not sure. But it attracted the user experience newbie crowd. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Any recommendations on how to do uh, user-centered design or any knowledge about other projects that have incorporated this in a volunteer-based way? I think I would say just to do the documentation, all of this. Right? If you design a persona, you have to make that public uh, available on every field or something, and you have to repeat everyone you want, like in the project mm -hmm. for people. Uh, I'll just repeat that. So the tip was to keep everything, keep uh, everything documented to have the personas uh, and the user research um, findings on the wiki. And I also don't know uh, if you make YouTube videos because I know that some people like to watch things if they're just reading it. Mm -hmm. and I think that when you make videos to, from YouTube, it's actually very, very my grandmother don't know how to install a media decoder. But if she looks it at the laptop and sees it at the video, she knows how to do it. So, so the tip was to, uh, that, uh, to make videos as well, uh, because they're, for some people, more easy to digest. Uh, yeah. I had a comment about, I was debating um, the use of personas in general with a colleague the other week with Gavin. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the, the, the use of either proto personas, I guess proto personas in particular, but also zero personas, how useful it is because a lot of people are just uncomfortable with them. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like a lot of projects, they always have this like the user they talk about. They wouldn't use like the personas, right? But they're like, oh, the user would do this, and the user would do that. Yep. So all projects just always use it anyway, just mm -hmm. that they call the person the user. Yeah. So uh, just to repeat that, um, the comment was that uh, he and uh, Andreas and Garrett, uh, a colleague, uh, were debating whether personas make sense, how useful they are, um, and especially proto-personas, if they're useful at all. Uh, but at the same time, we refer to persona. We, we, whenever we're doing design, even if we, if we don't have personas, we keep using the word the user. You know, the user would like this. The user would like something. So in our heads, there is a persona. We just don't actually put it down. And I agree with that. And um, I think I think personas are useful. I think they get a bad rap because uh, oftentimes what you see are proto personas that don't really have any back that aren't backed by research. Uh, so it's yeah. So so you could have elastic, the elastic user problem still because you're, you don't really have a person to actually work from. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.